Welcome to The Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We pray that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a message from Pastor Luke Cobray. I'm going to get down on my knees. I'm going to go before the Lord in prayer. If you're able to stand and you'd like to stand during prayer and prepare your heart to receive the honor of the Lord, why don't you go ahead and do that? Father, we come before you tonight. Lord, we thank you. Father, first and, first and foremost, we thank you that we are here today. God, whether, whether we're celebrating today or whether we're, we're crying out to you in time of need, Lord, we thank you that here we are right now today. God, there's no better time than right now. Lord, we thank you that we could uh, be in the house of God. Lord, we don't come into this place to hear from a man or to hear from a woman, to hear from the old or the young or the black, the white, the brown or anything like that or any other, any other person like that. God, we come into this place to hear from you. And with that, we fully acknowledge that Jesus is the senior leader of this house. And in the name of Jesus, God, we ask that your precious Holy Spirit would be our teacher tonight would be our counselor, would speak to us, to show us things out of the Word of God, Lord, as we discuss the, uh, the, the things of the Word of God tonight. Lord, I thank you that you would teach us some precepts, some, some thoughts, and show us and reveal to us your will, your way, your desire for our lives. And God, I thank you for the equipping of the saints tonight, Lord, that we might leave equipped and empowered to go and to be your church, to reflect your goodness and your glory to a lost and dying world. And Lord, we thank you for the blessings that you've given to us. Lord, we don't think of ourselves as better than anybody else, but rather co-laborers in the body of Christ, working together with all the churches across the world and around the Inland, Inland Empire, especially that are preaching and hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ. So, Father, we thank you that you would bless our brothers and sisters, whether they be, whether they be denominational, Father, whether they be the non-denominational or local brothers and sisters all around the area. Father, we thank you for them. And, Lord, we thank you that we are all many members of one body that is the body of Christ working together to build your kingdom for your glory. So, Father, to you be the praise, to you be the honor, to you be the glory. In Jesus' mighty name, we all said, Amen. Amen. Well, simple, short tonight, I, I, I want to take a look back. What we're going to do is we're going to look at something, I, I, something rather simple tonight. I'm going to look at a parable out of uh, Matthew, the 25th chapter. So if you've got your uh, Bibles, go with me to Matthew, the 25th chapter. And as we're coming up on the, the one-year anniversary of Freedom for Our Future in 26 years of ministry at the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We've been in the subject for the past couple of weeks, even before we were, before we even launched into the subject of teaching on finances, the past couple of Wednesdays, uh, Pastor Jim, when he had the opportunity to be in the, in the pulpit, was teaching us on, on prosperity and God's version and God's plan for prosperity. And I tell you, it's just been so amazing. And tonight I want to talk to you about a parable that Jesus gives to us. Now this parable is, is similar to the one that we find in Luke, but there are some very distinct Distinctive difference. So this is called the parable of the talents. Now in Luke we see a similar uh, parable, but they actually took place at different times in Jesus' ministry, but they were very similar to each other. And tonight what I simply want to do is I want to take a look at the parable of the talents that Jesus taught. And just take a look at the, what that means for you and I. And while this applies directly to our finances, I want to say this as well. Because, you know, whenever a church starts to, a subject or starts a series or even mentions the words finance or money, all of a sudden the critics come up. They're, they're quiet most of the time. But you start talking about anything from a pulpit about money and you'll hear the critics, you'll hear the grumbling, you'll hear the, the complaining. Oh, this, all this church wants is, is my money. All they talk about is the reality is, is is the, the Word of God, the more you dig into it, the more you get into the Word of God, the more you realize that what applies to grace applies to finances. That what applies to love applies to grace. What applies to, what applies to this applies to that. And so we're going to talk about Jesus giving a financial parable, a parable about finances. And this directly applies to our lives. This directly applies to freedom for our future, for what the church is doing, and what the church is endeavoring in. But this also applies to your and my life beyond finances. So you can't say Say, oh, all we do is talk about money because let me tell you something. The Bible addresses finances. Pastor Dan talked about this. 15% of the scriptures in the Word of God talk about finances. 15% of what Jesus, I'm sorry, 13% of scriptures talk about finances. 15% of what Jesus said talks about finances. But even though we're discussing a financial parable, let me, let me encourage you tonight. This applies more also beyond your checkbook. This applies beyond what we have to do with our finances. This applies as parents. If you're a parent with children, this applies to you as a parent, as, as a workers. This applies to you and I as employees or employers. This applies to us as neighbors, as, as brothers and sisters. This goes far beyond just finances in our lives. But we've got to understand some important thoughts. So with that, what we're going to do today, we're going to do things a little bit different and don't have four points. Actually, I do have four points, but they're not numbered one, two, three, four. All right. 
We're going to look through, we're just going to read through Matthew, the 25th chapter, and this parable, and we're going to pull out some truth, some, some interesting thoughts and some statements that Jesus makes that you and I can apply to our lives. The title tonight is Great Works for God. Great Works for God. We just had a couple of weeks ago our Good Works Expo, where we believe that we are out to, and God has designed us to do and desired us to do good works, and we also believe that good works. When we do good, it works. But I want to take it one step further. The, the whole idea, the whole concept, and we'll talk, you'll, you'll see this tonight through the pr progression of the night. The whole concept is, is that we can remain the same, that we can settle and be satisfied with good. But I'll tell you what, in my own life, I don't want to just be satisfied with good works. I want to go beyond good works to becoming somebody of great works. I want to see great things in my life from God. And I don't know if that's for you. I don't know if you want to see great things from God as well in your family, in your finances, in your city, in your, in your job, whatever it might be. But I'll tell you what, I believe that God's desire for us is to go over and above and beyond good into the category and the life of great works. And so we're talking about that, and here's an idea, or here's a thought from that, uh, out of the parable of the talents. Matthew, the 25th chapter. Matthew, the 25th chapter. Jesus has given us a, a really neat uh, parable or a story, uh, a descriptive story. Verse number 14, Jesus says, For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country, who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. The kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country. So what we have to understand here is that this is Jesus is relating this parable exactly to the kingdom of heaven, to the, the kingdom of God, to you and I, each and every one of us around the world, wherever we're at, whatever stage in life we're at, he says this is what it looks like. This is what it's like. A man who leaves on a road trip, who leaves to a faraway country and, and, and calls his servants and delivers his goods to them. Verse number 15. And to one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one. Oftentimes we as Christians struggle with this. Well, I thought that God doesn't, God is not partial. God doesn't have favorites. He doesn't hold on to, and he doesn't like somebody over here more or bless somebody more over here than over here. So oftentimes we see that and we struggle with that. Well, why, why God, am I only a one-talent person? Or why is that person over there a five-talent person and I'm only a two-talent person or, or a one-talent person or whatever it might be? But if you look at the following statement, he gave five, he gave two, and then he gave another one, each according to his own ability. Each according to his own ability. The interesting thing here is, as I talked about this three weeks ago on Sunday morning when we talked about finances and the Freedom for Our Future series, that God's desire and God's plan for us is to be successful. I truly believe in prosperity. But I believe that each and every one of us have roadblocks and hurdles that we have got to overcome, that we have got to get beyond in order for God to, to bless us with what he has planned for us. And according to our ability, according to what we can handle through the grace of God, God divvies it out, God gives it out. So here God, or the, this rich ruler, gives to his servants according to their own ability. And immediately, I love that, immediately he went on a journey. Uh, in the similar uh, parable in the, in the book of Luke, Jesus says that he gave uh, minus or he gave uh, different goods to them to invest, to, to, to put to work. And then it says he gave them time to put it to work. The thought I want to pull out of this, the, the, the precept that I want to pull out of this out of verse number 14 and verse number 15 is that you and I are given what we need to succeed. We are given what we need to succeed. I, I kind of addressed this a couple of weeks ago. Oftentimes it's just, it's just our culture. It's just the way we, we are, the way we live that we often say, well, if, if I could just get a little bit more. If I could just have this much more, if I could just get this, or if I could just do that, or if God, if you could just give me this, then I'll be able to do that. But see, the Bible talks in this parable that he gave each according to his ability. He gave each according to his ability. But the thing is, is he gave each person something. He gave each person something. Now, we may not like that idea because we may, you may think, well, I, 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 in my own life, I only got one and I wanted five. But you see, as we get through the as we progress through the parable, we see what happens to those according to their ability. 
And so we are given everything we need or what we need to succeed. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us it's not on the overhead, but the Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians, the ninth chapter, verse number 10, that God is a God who supplies seed to the sower. He gives seed to the sower, which means that God is desiring for you and I to do something with our lives, and he has given to us a talent. Now, we use this word talent differently than what that word talent in the, Old, or in the New Testament means. You and I, when we hear of talent, we think of America's got talent. We think of, well, I can sing, or I can dance, or I can balance a plate on a stick, or whatever it might be. But a talent... In the New Testament time, as Jesus was was giving this example or this parable, a talent was the highest unit of currency at the time. Now, it's been some time since the United States has printed a $100,000 bill. But, as a matter of fact, there are $100,000 bills circulating in currency. You may not have have known that. The 28th president of the United States, his face is planted on a $100,000 bill. That is the highest unit of currency that the United States has. A talent was exactly like that. The highest unit of currency. As a matter of fact, they, they, they estimate that a talent was equal to 20 years working wages. So Jesus is giving a, a financial illustration. He says to each He gave 20 years working wages. Now, that kind of puts things into perspective if you think about it. Because he said, man, I I, I feel like I'm the the, the one talent guy. I don't know about you, but I would sure be happy to get 20 years working wages right now. Remember how we, remember how I said, we all say, oh, I wish I could just get a, a little bit more. How about here's 20 years of what you make more? Okay, so, so it's not that bad. The, the one talent guy, don't feel sorry for him. All right? They estimate that if somebody who had multiple talents to give or to hold would be a multi-million heir. All right? In today's currency, some, some commentators say that a talent is, is roughly $500,000. Could, could anybody use 500 grand just right now? I mean, Hallelujah. If you, don't, if you didn't raise your hand right now, we will pray for you afterwards because, you know, I know you, you're just lying or you just don't want to admit it. So see, he was, Jesus wasn't stingy in this illustration because there's, there's a message here, and the message is, is that we've been given what we need to succeed. Our, our, our abilities, our current status in life may not bring us to the, to the multiple talents or to the multiple millions of financially or whatever it might be. But God says, where you're at right now, I've got something for you. And I'm going to give it to you. I will supply seed to the sower. Looking at this parable, we see four major themes out of the parable of the talents. Four major themes. Here they are. You see the theme of resource or money. You see the theme of work or putting something to work. You see the resource of time or the, 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 the theme of time. And you see the, the theme of profit. Resource, work, time, and profit. Given this idea or given this thought, you and I could put together an equation that resource or the talent plus work at it plus the time it takes to work equals profit to us. I love what Martin Luther said. Martin Luther said, I have held many things in my hands, and I have lost them all. But whatever I have placed in God's hand, that I still possess. I have held many things in my hands and lost them all. But whatever I have placed in God's hand, That I possess. You see, we are given everything we need to succeed. God has given to us, even though it may not seem like it, even though it may not appear like it, God has given to us everything we need to succeed. As a matter of fact, what I want to do tonight, because we're talking about freedom for our futures, I just wanted to show you some testimonies that we've shown throughout the year. You may have seen these, you may not have seen these. You may may have been coming to church after these testimonies aired. But look look what one member of our church has to say about God supplying their needs. Daniel and I were asked to leave from the house that we were renting. We had four kids. We had nowhere to go. We kept trying to find places to rent and nobody would rent to us. In a sense, we were homeless. And our friends um, from the lock here, they said they had a 25-foot trailer and they offered it to us 
they had an, a vacant lot next to their house and so they said that we could stay there for as long as we needed to. The first campaign, when we were getting ready to build our church, but I remember we pledged this outrageous amount to us. It might as well have been a million dollars. And I told the Lord, I'm gonna trust you. I don't know how we're gonna fulfill it, but I'm gonna trust you. We sacrificed and we gave. And as we gave, God restored a lot of things like our credit. We were able to buy a house during that time. So we bought our first house during the first pledge. God was faithful to his promises. God restored Daniel to a position that he had had before, and he was working six days a week. He was receiving full benefits. He was getting bonuses. I challenged God to come through for that amount, and he was faithful. He did come through. We made that that we fulfilled that pledge. If I think about The Rock, it's been everything for me, the people here. The ministries, they they feed thousands of people. Us at one time, we were there in those food lines when we were homeless. We had didn't have food to feed our kids, and we stood in those lines to get food. This place does awesome, amazing things for people, hurting people. I, I love this church. God is so here, and you can tell. 13 years ago. When we built this building, they made a pledge. And they realized that given their current situation, it didn't look like it was possible, but God supplies seed to the sower. 13, see the amazing part about that testimony wasn't that, that's not last year's testimony, that was a 13-year-old story. God supplies seed to the sower. He's given us everything we need. In terms of the Rock Church and World Outreach Center, $13 million on a mortgage balance is nothing. You, you say, well, holy cow, Pastor Luke, that's not nothing. $13 million is nothing. But you know what? When the earth burns, if, if the earth was to, to, to be destroyed tomorrow and we were all to be called up to heaven to God and to account for our lives, who would own the note on $13 million? Nobody. Because it, it, it stays here. But you know what is priceless or what does translate to eternity? Souls. What have we been given here at the Rock Church and World Outreach Center? 20,000 people that attend this church. We have been given by God people. You and I together, we have joined together. This is what God has get, done for us and he has given each and every one of us in this place what we need to succeed in life and we have got to learn to start trusting God for that. So today we're looking at the parable of the talents going on Matthew the 25th chapter verse number 16 moving on. It says I love this part. It says in verse number 16 it says and then he who had received the five talents, went and traded with them and made another five talents. Thus, he got five. He doubled his money. Verse number 17, And likewise, he who had received two gained two more also. But he who had received one went out and dug in the ground and hid his Lord's money. After a long time had come, the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them. Look, at, look what it says. He came and he settled accounts with them. See, the, 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 the parallel or the, the similar parable of the minus in the book of Luke, Jesus says, go and take this and invest it. So even though we can't say that these are the two same parables, we can say that there's, we can imply that there are certain things that are, 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 are given to us, that Jesus gave the talents, or, or the, the ruler, I should say, gave talents to those according to their ability not to sit on it, not to babysit it, not to just look at it, but rather to do something with it. And we see that he came and they double, one doubled his money, the other doubled his money, and one buried it. And then it tells us that he came and he settled accounts with them. He came back and said, what have you done with what I gave you? What we take from this is this very statement, that stewardship will always involve action. Stewardship will always involve action. Can I take it one, one step further? Let's just say it like this. Christianity will always involve action in our lives. The Bible tells us in the book of James that faith without works is dead. James says, you, you say you have faith, I will show you mine by my works. Let me prove to you what I am doing or what God has because I am a man of action. Stewardship requires or will always involve action. 
The first person based his ability, based on his ability, received the most. Why? Because the master likely trusted this man. He had probably been proved over the time. He had probably, this, this man, for all we know, could have been a one-talent man years and years before. And as the master went, he said, well, you, you did good. Here's two talent. Now, okay, here's three. Here. And he trusted. And the next man, based on his ability, the master knew where he was at. It goes on. You see, uh, the master trusted because this man was a man of action. You know what a steward is? Simply put, a steward is someone who is employed to take care of something for somebody else. We use the word stewardship. Whenever you hear stewardship nowadays in church, it, it relates to money. And yes, it does. But did you know that a steward is somebody that is employed to take care of something for somebody else? Well, how about this? How about you and I being employed or, 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 or empowered by God to take care of what has been given to us? Point number one, or the first thought that we have been given everything so God has given to us. Now we are under God's employ to take care of what has been given to us for somebody else. There are three employees in this parable expected to care for the talents given to them. We see two subjects. We see one that is wicked and lazy, and we see one that is, or two that are good and faithful. What are you and I going to be like in our lives? Because stewardship always involves action. We cannot sit around and wait to be entitled or wait to be empowered or wait for God to bless us so that we can do something. It means that you and I have got to learn to get up off of our duff, to get up off of our butts and get out there and do something for the kingdom of God. Not just financially, hello, but spiritually. We have got to learn that Christianity is all about action. Christianity is all about getting up there and doing something. I love this, the, the, the testimony of the story of, uh, uh, of Owen and Janice. Why don't you look at stewardship requiring action? Look at this. Pastor Jim, he made a statement. If you picked up 20 cans a day, you'd have a dollar. So I took it to heart. And I yes. said, well, you know, let's try this. So I started, had my neighbors see me going through the dumpster. I started sharing with the neighbors as they asked me what I was doing. And I told them, I said, we're trying to pay off our church. We collected like 500 cans this morning oil. One dumpster. Can you imagine from cans? Oh, 150 so bucks <laughs> from so cans and stuff. Yeah. Especially when Pastor Jim said 30 bucks a month and that was like 50 bucks a month. You have to have a desire to want to give. Yes. If it's not there, you can't force this thing. No. And if you do, he will show you right where you are. Yes, he will. Stuff you can do. You ask You know? Him. Yeah, you and ask him. He will tell you. Talk yeah. to friends and families and yeah. tell people what you're doing, what you're trying to yeah. accomplish. And you'd be surprised how many people want to help. And the thing is, once you start, the Lord's going to bless it. You see? Because I, I know. I mean, come on. I started out with, you know, 20 yeah. cans a day. And <laughs> today I did 500. So who did that? So once you start out, start somewhere. San Bernardino? Yeah, by they example. They know about the rock. And I'm proud to say that my church is <laughs> Stewardship requires action. Oftentimes in the Freedom for Our Future campaign, what they were talking about, Pastor Jim was saying, a dollar a day. Start with a dollar a day. And so many people, well, oh, I just can't do that. I don't have a dollar a day. I can't. But you see, if we don't start, if we say, well, I can't, therefore I won't, then we become like that steward or that employee who sat on or who buried what God gave us. They, did, you, did you notice what Owen said? He said, I went and I started digging in the dumpster. And he said, my neighbors saw me. Which means he was unashamedly digging through the dumpster. It wasn't, oh, someone's coming, let me dive down. Oh, oh. So I'm going to do something. If we don't start, if we, keep, if we keep sitting there or keep as Christians waiting and saying, God, I'm just waiting for the opportunity. God says, I've given you the opportunity. You have been given everything you need, but you've got to start with what you have. It may not be a lot, but start somewhere in life. Start somewhere in your finances. Like Pastor Jim talked about a couple of weeks ago in the financial series, Freedom for Our Future, two weeks ago, when it comes to tithing. Pastor Jim gave an amazing a statement that you would rarely ever hear any preacher say that tithing was, was abolished or tithing was completed with Jesus Christ in the New Testament, but it's about the gift of the heart. And 3% from the heart or 5% from the heart is more blessed than 20% out of grudging obligation. Why? Because God's desire is for you and I to start somewhere. 
to stop sitting around saying, God, if I only had this, then I'd start. God says, you've got something. Start, and I'll show you what you can do with it. Stewardship always requires action. Going on, Matthew, the 25th chapter. Matthew, the 25th chapter. Now in verse number 20, we find ourselves. So, moving on. Uh, Matthew, the 25th chapter. So, he received five talents, came and brought the other five talents, saying, Look, I have gained five more talents besides them. His Lord said, Well done, good and faithful servant. You are faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of the Lord. He would also receive two talents, came and said, Look, I've gained two more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Last, our set, third thought for tonight, our lives ought to reflect the prophets of God. Our lives ought to reflect the prophets of God. You see, the, Gal the, the Bible tells us in the book of Galatians that the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, goodness, faith, meekness, gentleness, kindness. You see, these are fruits. Fruits are prophets, signs of success. God's desire for us, church, listen, God's desire for you is to succeed. God's desire for you is to prosper. God's desire for you is to profit in life because we have the fruit or the evidence of the Spirit in our lives. So our lives are to reflect the prophets of God, not just financial prophets. We are stewards of time. We are responsible for what God has given to us. We are stewards of so much more. Prophets, a sign of success. It's God's plan for each and every one of us to profit, to profit in our lives, to listen here, listen, to profit in our lives, to profit in our ministry, to profit in our relationships, to profit in our health, to profit with our children, to profit what we put our hand to. We are known by our fruits, by our profits. So our lives, God's desire is for us to reflect God's profits. That's why he tells his servants, well done, good and faithful. Why? Because you did did something with what you had. Our lives are to reflect the prophets of God. Going on, we'll see in just a moment. The servant says, to, the lazy servant says, here's your money. This parable is not even about money. This parable is about profit because he, the, the servant says, here is what is yours. Here's a, you can have it back. I've got it for you. He says, I don't want what is mine. I want profit. God says to you and I, I've given you something. I've given you a life. I've given you talent. I've given you ability. I've given you something to put your hand to. It may be a lot or it may be little in your eyes, but it's something and you start. And when you see it, then you make profit and you can enter into the joy of the Lord. One of my favorite testimonies that, I, that I've seen throughout this entire process is, is, a, is a man that I love. His name's Raymond. Why don't you look at a man whose life reflects the prophets of God? My name's Raymond. I was a, a gang member at an early age. At 15, I started using a heroin, in and out of jail. My first arrest was like 1979, and I was like, man, I was like 13 years old. And ever since then, I was just going like a revolving door in and out. I would come out and do the same thing over again. And before you know it, I went to prison, and I did a total of like maybe like 20 years behind um, prison. But a couple years ago, I was passed by this church, and something would tell me, pull, pull in, pull in, but I never did. It took about a couple months, and finally one day I just pulled in, I made a right turn. I got off and I came in, as soon as I stepped in, the Holy Spirit just hit me. I sat down, as I'm listening to Pastor Jim, it looks like he was talking to me. After that, I, I felt the Holy Spirit and everything, and ever since then, I, I came back. That day was the last day. I didn't use drugs that morning. If I wouldn't have turned, I probably went and picked up. And today, I'm drug-free. It's just like, it, I'll drink and everything. It's like, it's wonderful. I never thought that I could do this. The only way I did this was through Jesus Christ. You know, I never graduated from high school. And Sunday, the June 2nd, I graduated with Captain Honor. It was a good feeling. Even for a future campaign, I got involved because this church gives a lot to people around the community and everything. I live in San Bernardino and I see the, the houses abandoned, I see the drug addicts, and I see the church going to Bracita Park and giving out food and things, presents to the kids. I want to get this church paid off because it did a lot for me, it changed my life. But the Jesus did that, but through this house of the Lord that was here. If it wasn't here, I would never stop. Somebody was praying as I was passing by. The, the Holy Spirit's pulling people in from that bridge or wherever. And I finally turned in and I'm just grateful and I'm glad that the Lord, that we serve a Lord that forgives us.
Raymond, a man whose life reflected the world and the circumstances around him. The gangs and the drugs and, and the culture that he was in and where he was at. He, was, he headed down the obvious path, but at some point he found Jesus. And when he found Jesus, his life began to reflect the prophets of God. His life began to reflect God's desire for his success, God's desire for his fruit. And then you saw he graduated. I remember I was a church history teacher in the Bible college. Raymond was one of my favorite students. I'm not supposed to have favorites, but Raymond was one of my favorite students in the class because that dude would always sit on the edge of his chair and just want more and more and more. Why? Because when you get into God, your life should reflect the prophets of God. Look, God, here's what you've given to me. Here's what I've done with it. Here is what I have done with it. I've put it to work. Looking on and moving on in Matthew, the 25th chapter, looking now at verse number 24, then he who had received the one talent came and said to the Lord, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you have not sown, gathering where you have not scattered seed. And I was afraid, and I went and I hid your talent in the ground. Look, there you have what is yours. But his Lord answered and said to him, You wicked and lazy servant, you knew that I reap where I haven't sown, that I gather where I haven't scattered seed. So you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers. And at my coming, I would have received back my own with interest. There's that profit thing again. Then he goes on and he says, Therefore, take the talent from him and give it to the one who has ten. Listen to that. To the one who has ten. Who has ten? Only, there was a guy that had five. How does he have ten? Because he came back and he says, Look, here's, the, here's what I've done. I've doubled the money. He didn't say he took it back. He said, Give him to the one who has ten. Are you, are you seeing that? Are you, are you catching Is that? Whoosh. He didn't say give it to the one who has five and made five more and gave it back, right? Oh, are you getting there? Give it to the one who has ten, which means God gives us. See, that's what I'm saying. If you've got one talent right now, may I say, Pastor, Pastor Luke, God, I feel like I've got a, a, a tenth of a talent. Well, start with a tenth. And guess what? Then you'll get a twentieth. Well, you'll, yeah. Then you'll get a, then you'll, that's, that's smaller. You'll get a fifth. All right? Yeah, there you go. All right? Then, then, then you'll get a half, right? And, and, and then you'll get three quarters. Then you'll get one. Then you'll get two. It's simple arithmetic. Then you get, then you get four. Then you get eight. Then, okay, anyways, I can add. I can count. I just got to take my shoes off if I go any further. <laughs> what this says to you and I is that how we view God dictates our behavior. I said this three weeks ago. Our view of God determines our outcome. How we view God dictates our favor. You see, do we see God as our provider? Do we see God as the one who supplies seed to the sower? Do we see God who is able when it doesn't seem like it's able or when it's possible, when it doesn't seem possible? Or do we see God like this servant? He said, I saw, I knew that you were a hard master. I knew that you reaped where you didn't sow. I knew that you had, had gathered where you didn't plant. You see, how we see God dictates our behavior. Because this man was afraid, because of his viewpoint of his master, because of his viewpoint of his Lord, he buried his talent in the ground and did nothing with it. So if we see God as our provider, as our enabler, we will work to achieve what God has set before us because we see that God has given to us. But if we see God as a hard taskmaster, like Pharaoh with the, with the Hebrews, who said, I want more bricks, I want more production, but I'm going to reduce or I'm going to pull away your supply, then guess what? We have nothing to work for in our lives. So how we see God dictates our behavior, how we view God. Erwin Lutzer said that faith is only as good as the object in which it's placed. Faith is only as good as the object in which it's placed. Toz, A. W. Tozer says, faith is seeing the invisible, not the non-existent. How we see God, God is there. He didn't leave us. He's not abandoned us. God is there to supply seed to the sower, to encourage us to say, hey, I've given this to you. I've given you the knowledge, the wisdom, the ability to go and to invest, to go and to do more, to go and to supply, to multiply, to be fruitful around your lives. But we have got to do something with it. I love this. Look what, look what Fernando and Griselda did in their lives. 
Well, first, so we came to the to La Roca. It was 2009. We felt so honored and privileged to come and be part of La Roca and see this explosion of the Hispanic Church here in this campus. As soon as we heard about the uh, future, uh, the goal, right away we knew we were going to be part of it. God wanted us to go ahead and give three times the amount that we had agreed we were going to. I said, honey, uh, listen, uh, the Lord put this in my heart and I feel this is what we have to go ahead and follow. And then she tells me, well, we're going to go ahead and believe and trust the Lord on this. We left the church, we went to eat, and then we are at the house. I remember, I'm in the bedroom. She comes in with two letters. When I look at the first letter, it says, it was a student loan that she owed. This amount has been paid in full. And then I picked up the other letter, and then the other letter said, your balance has been paid in full. And we know that God at that moment was the one that wanted us to go ahead and show us that whenever you trust in him, he will always do great things for you. We praise the Lord because he knew our hearts. He knew our commitment. He knew the walk in faith that we had just done. And we encourage everybody to do the same thing. Take that step in faith because when you have faith, God will do what he has to do and what he has planned to do because he knows our heart. Just walk in faith. Do the first step to, to make the decision and God will take care of the rest. I love that. They said three times what they said in their heart. How can they do that? They would have seen, said, God, there's no way you're not able. You can't do this. You're, you're, just, you're just trying to pick on me. You're trying to make me struggle. You're trying to make me squirm in my life. But rather their opinion or their view of God was, you know, God's able. Let's do this. Let's reach out. And look what God did. He came through because he supplies seed to the sower. See, how you and I view God will determine our behavior. It's time for us, church, to look back at what we see in this parable, to look back at things that we learned, that God has given us what we need to succeed, that God's plan for us in Christianity involves action to get up and to do something, that our lives ought to always reflect God's profit in it, and that we should see God as our provider, not as our hard taskmaster, not to be afraid of worrying or squandering what God has given to us, but rather to apply it, to use it, and to put our neck out there to put our faith out there for God because we're not believing in the impossible but we are believing in the invisible. And I love what Jesus says at the end of this parable in Matthew the 25th chapter. He says, for to everyone who has who has do you remember how he said give it to the one who has 10 because he did something with it. For to everyone who has more will be given and he will have an abundance. But for him who does not have, who's that? The one that didn't do anything with it. Even what he has will be taken away. Verse number 30, he says, and cast the unprofitable servant into outer darkness where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Our lives are to reflect the glory and the profit of God in everything, you do, everything we do. But it starts by doing something in our life. So you see, church, regardless of whether it's finances or whether it's, whether it's uh, witnessing or, or, or sharing our testimony, regardless of whether it's worshiping, regardless of how it's parenting, whatever it is, we can do great things for God. Amen? Did you guys get something out of the word of the Lord today? As we conclude tonight, I want to take just a quick moment. I don't, I don't want to take much more of your time, but I simply need to ask you a question so that you can examine your heart because it would be a shame for us to leave and assume that everybody's in the right place with God. So really quickly, here's what I want to do. And I just want to ask you a question, and nobody's going to know this question except for you and God. If you were to leave right now and your heart were to, die, uh, to stop and you were to die, boom, would you go to heaven or would you go to hell? That's a simple question. You know, Nobody's going to know that answer except you and God. And the question follows, if you say, yeah, I think so, well, what makes you so sure you're going to get to heaven? Did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that you can hope, think, or want? Did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that you, if you have a positive outlook on life or if you've got a, 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 you know, a, a good, goodwill life that you're going to get to heaven? Did you know that nowhere does it say that because your parents told you, because you attend church, because you're here tonight, because you've got a cross around your neck, or because you give yourself the title of Christian? Did you know that nowhere in the Word of God will you find that you can get to heaven because of any of those things? You, you can't get to heaven because you're a good person. You can't find that in the, in the Bible because you never robbed a 7-Eleven or because you do more good in your life than bad. You try, to, you try to improve the world around you rather than tear it down. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you're a good person, you're going to get to heaven. See, the thing is, is that it's God's heaven. The only way to get to God's heaven is God's way. Can't get to he God's heaven your way. Can't get to God's heaven my way or any well-meaning church committee or author's way. The only way we can get there is God's way. And Jesus says this. 
In the book of John, he says that he is the way, the truth, and the life. No one goes to the Father except through him. So today, let's not do this any other way but God's. And Jesus says this to a religious man of his day, Nicodemus, a man who gave to the poor, a man who, who gave of his finance, a man who was a good steward of what God gave him, and who, who knew the scriptures, who, who taught in the synagogue or the church of his time. He said to Nicodemus to, uh, regarding the subject of eternal life, in order to inherit eternal life, you must be born again. That's God's way. You say, oh, wait a minute, what is that? You're talking about that crazy, weirdo, out of control Christianity. Let me tell you something. I don't care what Hollywood's made it out to be, made it out to sound like. It's, it, it, they have no concept of what God is. But let me tell you, from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, in the eyes of God, born again has always meant the same thing. Here it is. You ready? It means that you've given God all of your heart. You've given God all of your life. It's an all or nothing relationship that God's after. He's not after your, your penance. He's not after your occasional church attendance. Or he's not after your goodwill, your good actions, your good lifestyle. None of that's going to get you and I to heaven. Simply put, God's desire is for all of our heart, all of our lives. The Bible tells us that the demons in hell and the devil in hell know who Jesus is. They're not on their way to heaven. You already know who Jesus is. That's why you're here tonight. But the Bible says it's all about, it's an all or nothing relationship. Let me prove it to you. In the book of Revelation, the very last book of the Bible, Jesus is speaking to the church, to the church. And he says he's going to come back. And when he comes back, he better find the church hot or cold, you and I, hot or cold. Because if he finds us lukewarm, he will vomit us from his mouth. Whoa, the shocking statement. And what Jesus is saying is that lukewarm Christians are not real Christians at all. And will be rejected and ejected from the kingdom of God. What does lukewarm mean? Lukewarm simply means that you're doing a little bit of God saying a little bit of your own thing. Occasional church attendance, doing some, some, some over here, a little bit over there, token prayer. Not wholehearted for God, not wholehearted against God. You're riding the fence. And Jesus says that that's you. You're in a bad place to be because you are deceived in thinking that you're going to make it into heaven when you're really not. I love you enough. I respect you enough. I honor you enough to tell you the truth today. You can't get to heaven based on your own devices. Can't get to heaven because you're a good person, because your parents told you. Can't get to heaven because you, you volunteer in the children's ministry, the youth ministry. The only way you can get to heaven is God's way. And Jesus said this. He said that if you confess him before men, He'll confess you before his father. So all across this auditorium, I want to give you the opportunity in just a moment, wherever you're at, whether you're in the front row, whether you're in the back in the family rooms, if that's you guys, I'm talking to you right now. If you're, if you're watching online or in the foyer, or you hear the sound of my voice, wherever you're at, this is your moment. This is your opportunity. And Jesus said that if you confess him before men, he'll confess you before his father. If you deny him, he'll deny you. So here's what I want to do. I'm going to give you a quick opportunity. In just a moment, I'm going to count to three. I'm going to go one, two, and on the count of three, I'm going to go three. Smack my hand on my Bible real loud like that. And when I do, I want to give you the opportunity. What I want you to do is I want you to pop your hand up. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is just saying, hey, I want to make sure today I get into heaven. Pastor Luca, I, I, today I want to give my heart. I want to give my, my life to the Lord. I want to give him all today. I, I want to make sure today I do that. I'm a man. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it. You can put your hand right back down. I won't embarrass you. But even if you were embarrassed, wouldn't it be better to spend a moment of embarrassment than an eternity in hell because you couldn't go forward for God? You see, the decision's yours. God's not a manipulator. He's not a conniver. He's not, a, not, not up there in heaven waiting with a two-by-four to whack you over the head because of the dumb things you've done. He's not a kid on an anthill burning you up. God loved you enough. He loved me enough to send Jesus Christ to die a beaten bloody mess, to hang on a cross naked for the world to see, for our sin, for our shame. And in return, he wants all of our heart. He wants all of our life. What you're doing by the raising your hand is saying, hey, I want to do that today. I want to make sure today. I want to, I want to give him my heart. I want to give him my life. You say, I might be embarrassed. Don't let a moment of embarrassment stop you from making the right decision. This is your moment. This is your time. All across the auditorium, I'm going to count to three in just a moment. If that's you, pop your hand up. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it. You can put it right back down. We'll pray together right after that. Who should raise your hand? You never give him your heart. You never give him your life in just a moment. Get your hand up. Who should raise your hand? You're not sure. Hey, ho, ho. Don't leave today without making sure. That's a gamble on your eternal life you can't afford to make. So if you're not sure, maybe you did this at a harvest or a Billy Graham crusade, or you did this as a child, but you never really followed through. Come on, let's make this the night. Come on, June 18th, 2014. Let's make this the night you go forward in your relationship with God. Who should raise your hand? Maybe you've been living lukewarm, doing your own thing instead of God's thing. You've been running from God instead of to God, not wholehearted for God, but you're not wholehearted against God. Hey, you're riding the fence. Get out of that uncomfortable position. Let's go forward for God in your relationship today, ensuring your place with God in heaven forever and ever and ever, leaving hell behind. Regardless of whether you think it's real or you believe it's real or not, it's real. Real enough for God to tell us about it. Real enough for Jesus to teach us about it. Real enough for the Bible to be preserved over thousands of years so you and I could understand and see the reality but there's more to our life than what we have right here. Something's going to happen after we die. And the decision is wholly ours. God loved us enough to give us a free will choice. He's not in the business of condemnation. He's in the business of redemption. But it's your choice. So today, all across this auditorium, wherever you're at, I'm going to count to three. If that's you, in just a moment, get ready. Pop your hand up. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it. You can put it right back down in the family room. Just pop it up. Hey, be proud. This is a moment of pride for you. Wherever you're at, all across this auditorium, here we go. I'm going to count to three. If that's you, get ready. This is your time. This is your moment. 
Today is the day of your salvation. Here we go. One, two, three. Let me see your hands in this place. One, two, three, four, five. I see you right over there. Five, six. I see you. Seven, eight, nine. I see you right over there. Nine wise people. Anybody over there in the family rooms? In, uh, in the, how many is that? Three? 10, 11, 12, 13. I see you right over there. 14. I got you right over there. Uh, 14. I got you over there in the family room. 14 wise people. Anybody else? 15. I see the hand in the back. 15 wise people. Anybody else? You say, man, I want to do this today. Anybody else? Anybody else in this place? 15 wise people. Well, hey, praise God for 15 wise people. All right, here's what we're going to do. For those of you in the family room, in the, in the front row, the back row, wherever you're at, you don't get saved by raising your hand. You say, I want to make sure today. Today, we're going to pray together. We're going to change destinies in just a moment, but that involves action on your part. involves doing something, and that means getting up out of your seat and getting up out of your chair. Grab your coat, your sweater, your purse, your Bible, a friend if you need a friend. If you came with somebody, hey, say, look at them and say, will you come with me? Whatever it might be, we're all going to stand in just a moment. Elijah's going to sing a song. If you raised your hand, or you should have raised your hand. As we stand, I want you to grab your stuff, grab your coat, your sweater, your purse. The ushers will help you guys out in the family room. I know you got a bunch of baby gear and kid gear. They'll help you get all that stuff. Get out of your seat. Get out of your chair. Come meet me right here. We're going to change destinies together right here, right now. Come on, if that's you, let's go. Come meet me right here. Let's change Jesus, destinies today. Yeah, come on, wherever you're at. The family rooms, that's you. In the back, in the front, wherever you're at. Come on, this is your time. Right on, man. Great job, man. Great choice. All right, Hey, guys. Congratulations. Hey, congratulations. Right on, dude. Awesome choice. Congratulations. Come on. Come on. Yeah, don't be shy. Come on. Come on, girl. Congratulations. If that's you, you can come. Come on. Congratulations. Congratulations. Come on, my man. If that's you, come on. Look at you guys, looking good. Jesus, I, I, I don't smell, I promise you. Congratulations. You're the reason that I live. Praise God. Hey, listen, today is a new day. You're not going to a funeral, all right? So you can smile. It's a good day. You're going to a birthday celebration. Today is the first day of the rest of your life. You're going to be born again. Here's what I want to do. I want to introduce a friend of mine to you. See this guy right over there? He's waving at you. I'm going to make you do it. Give me, let me see it. Let me see the man wave, Pastor Joel. No, no, not that. All right, see that guy right over there, big old wave? Pastor Joel, he's a really cool guy, a really neat guy. What he's going to do is he's going to take you right over there. Listen, I promise. Oh, my goodness. Nothing weird goes on, okay? I am as weird as it gets, and you made it through. We only bring out the snakes when Pastor Dan preaches, okay? No, I'm just teasing. I'm just teasing. I'm just teasing. He's going to take you right over there. He's going to lead you in a prayer. You get saved by making Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior. Okay, so he's going to lead you in a prayer. He's going to pray with you. Second thing he's going to do is he's going to give you some free information. You walk out of this place and say, what do I do next? We're going to point you in the right direction. Some free literature, real easy reading. Last thing he's going to do is he's going to give you a friend. We give away friends here at the church. You know, you go to the gym, you get a personal trainer, somebody that make, works with you, sits with you, make sure you're not wasting your time on all that equipment you have no clue how to use. We give you friends here called spiritual personal trainers. Somebody that will sit with you, buy you a cup of coffee before church, sit with you for five weeks, teach you some things about the Word of God to get you straight strong in the ways of God. So you don't go back to the life that you're walking away from. And I want to ask something for you. I know it's a lot. I know it's a lot to take in. It's like drinking out of a fire hose. But let me ask this. You heard the word of God. That's why you're here right now. It's not because of me. It's because of God. So let me ask you to do this, to commit to sitting under the word of God in the place that you heard from God right here at the Rock Church. I'm not asking you to sign a contract or anything like that. I'm simply asking you to sit and listen to the word of God for 12 months here at the church. And I promise you, if you do, your life will never be the same. You will be so far above what you thought God would take you because I'll tell you what, when you show commitment, that's when God shows up. So if you just go to your left, my right, right over there with Pastor Joel. Congratulations. Woo! Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. 
And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin, and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Thank you for listening to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. If this message spoke to you, please share it with us. We'd love to hear from you. You can find more information at www.rockchurch.com.